Hi, everyone. Good morning and good afternoon and good evening to wherever in the country or Europe you're tuning in from. Um, thank you so much for joining us today for this really important conversation around diversity and inclusivity backstage. The CFDA is so proud to be collaborating with Celia Sears, who is the founder and president of Show Division on this important topic. Celia recently penned a piece for CFDA.com called I Don't Do Black Hair, which opened up a dialogue and provided solutions and resources to ensure that backstage culture becomes more inclusive and equitable. If you've not read the piece yet, I highly recommend you go check it out on CFDA.com and I'll make sure to forward it to everyone who's joined this uh, webinar today. So we didn't want the conversation to just stop there. Uh, so we're really thankful to this incredible group of experts and to Celia who put it together to continue this dialogue. So before I introduce everyone, um, I just wanna remind you all that there is a feature to submit your questions um, for our panelists to answer, which we will do towards the end of the conversation. So it is my pleasure to introduce, I will start with Celia, our, our fearless leader in this conversation, who I said is the founder and president of Show Division, which is a global leader in providing backstage artistic support and logistics on the most important fashion shows and productions. With a collective of over 250 internationally recognized hairstylists, makeup artists, manicurists, and production specialists based around the world, team Show Division artists bring to life fashion shows for names such as Prada, Gucci, Louis Vuitton, Christian Dior, Valentino, Hermes, Chanel, Marc Jacobs, the list is so long, it would take up this whole hour. Um, and in 2018, uh, Sears expanded the business and created Show Division Pro Session Development, a multi-level educational program implementing higher standards of training to professional hairstylists and makeup artists in backstage etiquette, team dynamics, and artistry. Show Division also created the first of its kind textured hair program specifically designed for backstage session stylists. Also joining us today is Kendall Dorsey. Uh, Kendall is a hairstylist whose hair techniques have graced the pages of Allure, Essence, Magazine, Numero, Refinery29, The Zoe Report, New York Mag, Vogue, and many more. His clients include Solange, Lizzo, Yara Shahidi, Cardi B, and Nicki Minaj. With nearly 15 years of beauty know-how under his belt and a longtime Oribe hair care educator, Kendall's background in hair instruction sets him apart in all aspects of his artistry. We also have Romero Jennings uh, joining us, who is Director of Makeup Artistry for MAC Cosmetics. Romero joined uh, MAC back in, in the 1990s. After working in Japan, where he was offered a place to study and assist makeup artists such as Mitsuro Kono and Savaro Watanabe, Jennings returned to New York, where a standout career moment was landing a full page interview in the New York Times Magazine. A few of his celebrity clients include um, Daphne Guinness, singer Mary J. Blige, Carrie Hilson, Estelle, Sierra, Cindy Lauper, Tony Collette, Rosamund Pike, and Anika no uh, Noni Rose. We also have Navasha Johnson, who is a New York-based hairstylist. She specializes in natural hair, hair color, wigs, and men's grooming. Her celebrity clientele include Alicia Keys, Sasha Lane, Uzo Duba, Logan Browning, John Legend, and Common. Navasha has collaborated with top photographers on shoots appearing in major publications such as Vogue, Vanity Fair, Marie Claire, Elle, Harper's Bazaar, Allure, and W. Additionally, Navasha worked on major campaigns for Aerie, Google, Chanel, Bloomingdale's, Tory Burch, and Tiffany & Co. We also have Johnny Sapong, who is an internationally acclaimed groomer and hairstylist. He's contributed to top publications, including CR Fashion Book, Harper's Bazaar, Elle, Vogue, Numero, and has collaborated with high-profile photographers like Annie Leibovitz, Gilles Ben-Simon, and Steven Meisel. Sapong has worked with A-list celebrity talent such as Dakota Johnson, Kira Knightley, Jude Law, Cara Delevingne, Lily Rose Dapp, James, Fa James Franco, Naomi Campbell, and John Boyega, and, his, and has lent his talents for global brands like Dior, Givenchy, Calvin Klein, Topshop, and H&M. Johnny specializes in African-American hair and wig work. And last but not least, 
um, Tamu McPherson, who will be moderating this conversation, began taking her street style photographs back in 2006 for Glamour Italia, shortly after she began writing feature pieces for Vogue Pal and, began, and became a contributor at Elle Italia. Tamu launched All the Pretty Birds in November 2008 as a portfolio of her growing body of work. Becoming, uh, before becoming editor-in-chief of Grazia in February 2011, a position that she held until September 2010. After leaving Grazia, she held the position of style director at Out There, an international creative agency. Now she focuses her time on publishing All the Pretty Birds, as well as creating content for luxury brands as a digital talent in the areas of photography, styling, and fashion journalism. So thank you for being patient through that introduction. We have so many incredible, incredible industry professionals and experts. And I will pass the mic over to Celia. Well, thank you. First and foremost, uh, thank you, Sasha. Thank you so much for hosting this discussion, this very, very important discussion. It's an important first step in understanding backstage culture and the issues around um, inclusivity backstage. And we're happy also to be able to explore some of the solutions, viable solutions that can create a more uh, level playing field. So thank you. And thank you to all of our wonderful panelists for taking the time out. It's going to be a great conversation and, uh, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to hearing what everybody has to say. So now I think what I'll do is I'll just pass uh, the mic over to Tamu and, uh, and we can go from there. I think we can't hear you, Tamu. Hello, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say hello to everyone. I want to thank Celia for inviting me to be here and the CFDA. And I want to say it's so lovely to meet all you artists and I hope to see you one day in person. Um, so uh, we, should get <laughs> we should get started now. Um, I'm gonna propose a series of questions to the panelists and um, we'll have them answer them. Celia asked for me to just share um, an experience um, a personal experience um, working in the industry. Um, for one, um, I had a relaxer a while ago and I went natural because I actually had a burn. So I went to a, a salon that wasn't equipped to, to straighten my hair and I got a really bad burn and that's pr pretty much why I've always worn my hair natural um, since then. Um, I've also, working in the industry, I don't obviously work as much as you guys work with models. I'm not shooting every day. I'm not preparing runway shows. But in my um, small world, I have showed up to a set or to a project and the um, stylist not be able to do my hair. And that's a, another reason why I actually get my hair cut before I go anywhere, um, because I have found that people pretty much can't accommodate my hair and they often don't have the products that I like um, for styling. And in terms of um, same thing with makeup, I'm pretty low maintenance and, and that's one of the reasons. So we've heard countless stories from models and speaking out about their experiences backstage. And we know when they're preparing for a runway show, when they're preparing for a, a shoot. And we know that it's not a localized situation. We know that this is a global situation. Um, does the backstage experience in a fashion show or at a photo shoot play out differently for models of colors uh, when compared to their non-POC um, counterparts? I'm going to um, start with Kendall. Can you please just shed light on that question? Well, you know, during my time in the industry, um, coming up has been, it was, it's been different for me because I came straight from the hair salon where, you know, when I was trying to break into this part of the industry, there were no avenues for me to get to. So um, my first experience is working with Orbe Hair Care as an uh, educator, and I was able to, you know, learn all of the techniques to work, you know, with all hair textures, uh, specifically for um, Caucasian women, Middle Eastern women, and for me, if I didn't have the background experience from the hair salon, I would have never been able to mesh the two. So um, working backstage for me has, has been a challenge because when you are African-American backstage and you have four or five models, they want the four or five models to only come to the person that is able to actually handle the four or five models. And I feel like that puts us in a box because as we had my, my um, 
my counterpart here in the Basha, I'm sure she can speak on this. You know, they give us all of these African American girls, and that which I love, I actually love doing my, you know, my, my our people. However, I'm also capable enough to do um, a Bella or a Gigi or someone like that that is still, again, skip over my chair for someone that has maybe have a Vogue cover or someone has Vogue Italia. Their resume is a bit a bit longer than mine, but the guy or the woman that may can handle the job is only put into a specific box. So being backstage for me is, is a challenge and it's also a blessing because I'd love to see it all. But again, trying to change the narrative of this conversation and speaking out about it, that is exactly what happens. You, if you're black and you're back behind stage, you do black hair. And if you fit, com happen to complete the black hair before the, the other girls get there, then you're lucky. And coming into this industry as a baby and as a new guy with respect to everybody on the panel, you know, um, you, you're put into a box because this is the guy that can do textured hair. This is the guy that can do curly hair. This is the guy that can do a braid. Well, I spent six years on the Orbe team and I traveled the world teaching on how to do a perfect ponytail, on how to set rollers, how to build texture, how to tease hair. And never once really was it with an uh, African-American woman. Yet, we're put into this box. So that's what I would have to say about it. Uh, Navasha? Yes, um, I would really have to pick it back off of Kendall. Like, it's absolutely right. Um, and like him, I came from a salon setting. I didn't, I didn't start off as being an assistant or um, working backstage. I came directly out of the salon. And from the salon, I started doing editorial shoots. And so with that, the way that I was initially trained is that if my book was filled with African-American girls, I probably wouldn't get work. And so I was taught that the more white girls or the more Asian girls that were in my book, the more work I would have. And it wasn't until I moved to New York that I was able to change the narrative for myself. Um, for me, I'm a little different. I, I really do enjoy doing our girls. <clears throat> However, like Kendall, I am trained to do all hair. I'm a hairdresser. I'm not a black hairdresser. I am a hairdresser. And I can do a beautiful blowout. I can do a set. I can do a perm and a relaxer. You know, I can do all the things. I can do um, a beautiful color. So to box us in, even though I have a, a huge body of work of curly hair and a textured hair, I also have a, a beautiful body of work of straight hair and of wavy hair. And so to box me into just the curly girl is, is not okay. Or to only put me backstage to work with only people of color is not okay. And, and you know, one of the latest stories that I have, I went to a shoot for a big publication and it was during the COVID time. They had everyone else upstairs, makeup, nails, styling, and talent. And they had me, who was the only black person in the entire group, downstairs in a room isolated by myself. That was probably, in all of my career, the most uncomfortable and hurtful experience in our industry that I've ever had. <clears throat> Especially in spite of everything that's going on right now, and I openly addressed it to the entire team with the director in there and said, hey, listen, I don't know what's going on right now, but I don't understand why I'm having to walk upstairs to do talent and all of my things are downstairs when the rest of the team is up here. And their excuse was, oh, what's well, COVID and we just wanted to make sure we were social distancing. And so I asked them in front of everyone, I said, well, is, is the rest of the team not social distancing? I'm just trying to understand why I'm the only one who's uh, a minimum of six feet away from everyone else and no one had an explanation. And so at that point, that's when you have to uh, grab your power <laughs> that, and remind them that, hey, I belong here just like this makeup artist, just like this nail artist, just like the talent, and just like the fashion coordinator. I belong here. So please send a PA downstairs to grab all my things and bring them upstairs with the rest of the team. Um, and that's actually how they have been doing us, whether they said it or not. When they don't have us backstage, a part of those Chanel shows and a part of 
those spending shows and, and all those other places that we belong, where they box us in to just like black talent, that is essentially what they're saying. That's essentially what they're doing. And in this particular instance, they just made it a little bit more, <laughs> more visible. Um, so yeah. I am so sorry that you had to experience that experience, but I am so inspired that you were able to advocate for yourself like that. And I hope that anyone who's watching can take away something like that. You can speak for yourself and you can um, ask them for clarification on why a situation is the way it is. And uh, thank you for that. Thank you for sharing that story. Uh, I'm gonna move on. I'm yeah. sorry, Kendall. I just wanted to do a piggyback off of what Navasha was saying is that, you know, um, she's speaking about doing the shows for Chanel and Fendi and all of those things. And for me, again, I'm not 20 years when uh, Chanel calls, I'm flipping my, I'm like so excited, so, so happy. And then they're like, well, you know, uh, we found someone to do what we, what, you, what we needed you to do. And that happens a lot on these major shows, major campaigns, major editorials, where they call you in because you're put into this box and then they fund someone that can do the job. And that's heartbreaking to an artist, you know, that lives, you know, that live in New York City that's trying to build something for themselves. You know, you move to New York City trying to build and trying to become. And you all you you do become of all these that are caught right to things, but you build a very, very thick skin that shouldn't be because this is a, 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 a industry of beauty. And so you walk into the, these rooms with this shield on. And you had you had this shield on. And for me, Navasha, I appreciate her for speaking up, but I would be petrified. Because I'm like, what do I, if I say something, I'm the black guy on the team that is speaking a fight. If I say something, I'm the angry black guy. You know, so, so I, I, again, I appreciate her for speaking up and I'm learning how to do those things on set like this because it happens a lot. I can imagine. Yeah. I can only yeah. imagine. Johnny, I'm going to pass the mic to you. Hi, darling. Hi. Um, yeah. So, no, it's interesting listening to what um, Kendall and Navisha are saying because, um, for a long time, I have to say, being backstage was definitely an isolated scenario. Um, you know, as as a as a sort of you know growing up in the in in London, um, we experienced the, the the scenario where you were backstage at the shows, and generally the black girls, black models, would come to your chair because they'd known you from the salon environment or from um, you know assisting on a shoot or something like that and it was it was building relations what also happened around that kind of thing was that designers were like looking at aspects of 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 ideas and it all came down to education you know i i trained in in an afro salon and i trained in a european salon so the combination was about techniques and this is where i think there there's 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 almost a, a, a stop gap because it's okay from one side for someone to be able to label and go, yeah, okay, you're a specialist in this. But I go down to really simple like, 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 like routes where you look at stuff and you say, if someone was going to be a chef, right, and they learn the basics to cook. If you, if you, when we're talking about like black hair, you should know how to do it as a hairdresser. And I think that, that, that listening to the 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 the, the um, you know comments from Navisha and Kendall where you know you're 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 coming into an industry and to be honest there's there's no um, lies about it it's it's a racist industry it's a racist world right but what are we going to do to change it and it's about the fact of sharing and I think that that's the thing is that you know I can work for Prada I can work for Chanel I could work for Calvin, Alexander McQueen, um, you know, but then there's also the other side where, you know, I've spent seasons hosting and heading up like various teams for African Fashion Week. You go out there, it's a whole different thing. I'm 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 then going in and trying to teach like black hairdressers who actually have trained hairdressers, but they've never had like white hair to do. So it's, it's, I think there's a, there's a scenario where we talk about who's teaching, who's training, and how people learn. 
because I think with everything, you know, when you come out of the salon background and you come out and you know like, the techniques because you've learned fundamentally, you know, hairdressing, you've been taught from, from, from the basis. So when we talk about, you know, being able to set hair, being able to, to, to dress hair, being able to master a wave, being able to cut hair, being able to color hair, it's all dynamics. Definitely within those areas, you know, there can be special specialities and there are special specialists. But I also think that it's 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 that thing of, you know, when we hear don't touch my hair or or no, you can't do that. I've been on shoots where, you know, the photographer's talking about the models and, you know, the stylist is saying something. And actually, that's because they don't understand. There's an ignorance. And I think that you know, through, through, through these journeys, you know, I used to like if, if, be in sort of like a, a, a total melancholy state when, you know, I had to live in Milan and it was a choice that I made because I was trying to build up my book and, you know, have a conversation with my agent and they're like, yeah, you know, you should go and live in Milan. I was supposed to be there six months. I lasted three, but that wasn't because it was, it was, difficult language or something like that but it was just the, the actual sheer um feeling of of being an outsider and feeling like you weren't wanted there because of the color of your skin and that 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 has changed you know things have evolved but it's also about the fact that you know let's be clear it's not just about being cool because you're black right it's about actually you know you're being hired because you've got the skills you've got the talent and actually the difference with that is, is that someone opens their eyes and can see that. Um, Romero? Well, it's the same for me. I, I agree with what everyone on the panel is saying. It does play out differently for people of color. I mean, I do walk in a room and I scan the room to see how many people like myself are there. And the models do it too. And like everyone here is saying, the models, you know, most people of color will gravitate over to you knowing that they believe you're the expert or, or from an experience as you guys are saying before they have the experience with you and they're telling their girlfriends go over to this guy you know but it does put you at a disadvantage because then you know the other models are looking at you like you know models that are that are of non-color are thinking maybe he can't do my skin but one thing i will say and i and i have noticed in the past prior to working for mac that you're in a room with um, many different diverse um, artists and in in many many cases like uh, models of color will walk over to say look at what just happened to me can you help me fix this the difference and luckily to work for mac for 26 years being in product development meetings you know making sure that there are diverse colors for all skin tones and the main thing is training you know artist training and you everyone spoke about this earlier where you know, Mac artists are trained that, you know, if you're backstage at Fashion Week, you can do every skin color. You know, Mac is about all ages, all races, all genders. And it's always been that way from the past with diverse products and people like RuPaul, Mary J. Blige that we put forward. And now it's a big conversation with brands, but we've been doing it for so long. So in that sense, I feel protected with artistry backstage where, you know, if you hear that Mac is, is king the show, there's like, people are relaxed. People, people know that I'm going to get my makeup done. And I'm going to look good, you know, but at the same time, you get people coming over, um, having issues for different reasons. So it's been, it's been challenging, you know, and even though things are changing and people are starting to speak about it, um, it still is challenging from, from day to day and you notice it. And there are certain times when there are waves of, um, of fashion where they're like okay the girls that are more caramel are in on trend now so they are 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 up front or in the room or the deeper skin models and it shouldn't be that way it should just be diversity all the way around all the time that should be in fashion all the time the one thing that all of you said kendall navasha johnny and romero is the fact that you all put so much into your training and that you are all so interested in being able to do everyone's hair and do makeup for all skin tones um on the flip side of that you know our non um people of color counterparts 
don't see it necessary to actually go out there and get the training. And hence, there's there's no um, imperative to do it. There's, you know, I think it's a part of their privilege more or say in the way that they navigate the world. And so the situation backstage is one such that you aren't necessarily um, getting the opportunities that you may like in terms of the, the, hair, the styling of the hair. And for the artists who aren't as fortunate as you Romero to work with a house that is committed to all skin types, we see this backstage and we see it like playing out. Are there other stories um, and experiences that you have heard from the models that you work with or from the other artists that you work with that speak to this situation? I mean, it's an unfair situation and it, it does show the inequity of the arts, the makeup arts, and the hairstyling arts in the industry. Um, can you just speak to that? I'll start with, I, I have you guys um, all lined up like this, so I'm not starting <laughs> according to any um, list. I'm just going um, from my screen. I'll start with, I'll start with Navasha this time. <laughs> Um, so yeah, can you just speak to um, you know just the the consequences of the situation? The the bottom line consequence of a situation is an unhappy model and an unhappy designer. That's really the bottom line. And as artists, we are put in those places to make that designer or that fashion house look incredible. That's just what, it, that's the bottom line across the board. And that includes the model, that includes makeup, that includes whoever um, the stylist is for that designer. That includes even the nails. That includes all of us. So the bottom line, when, <clears throat> when you have a hairstylist who's being disadvantaged because we're only boxed into black hair or someone who has a buzz cut and really has no hair, um, or you have a super, super, super chocolate girl and there are no black makeup artists there who understands her skin or even a white makeup artist there who understands her skin because I I'll come back to that. But <laughs> there aren't um, skilled technicians there who understand their skin and hair. At the end of the day, when that model hits that runway, that's not an amazing showing on anybody's part. The whole house is falling apart. Which and now, Johnny, oh, I'm sorry. Now you have a whole group that's disadvantaged. Okay. So I think um, when you talk about inclusivity and you talk about diversity and you, and you talk about these things, we have to look at the bigger picture. Yes, this is very much about skin. Yes, this is very much about race. This is, however, this is about the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is everyone getting to that common goal and that's to look right, and that's to have a great showing. And that can't happen if the, the platform is not level for everybody. And for, uh, and for the sake of history, it's not been a level playing field. Agreed. It has not been a level playing field, and to date, it's still not. Okay, yes, and Johnny? Um, I totally agree with Navasha. I mean, you know, what she's saying there is, kind of what I said to you in the beginning about, you know, arriving in this business and, you know, you, 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 you realize when you went to certain, certain cities that there was no, there wasn't a black people. So what, what, what happened there was inside your, your head, you kind of realized that, that you're here and why are you here? You're here because you want to work with the best. You have the desire and the dreams, you know, you want to be able to execute ideas shared vision and I, I i feel like that was implemented and helped along by people who were open and and um i think there was a, a level of big ignorance that you'd see and we and, and we still see it you know and i guess when i think about learning it goes back to that 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 element of how you're educated Right, so if you learn about doing hair, you know, it, 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 even on on set, at backstage, right, you're looking at a, a whole image. You know, it's the face, it's the hair, it's the nails, it's the, it's the whole look. And when we're creating looks and creating ideas, 
you know, we're bouncing off each other, we're working together. So you know that when um, you're, you're, you're doing a casting, from the point that you're doing a casting and the show's being produced, right, these things are all thought of. And if it's an afterthought, it's only leading for a disaster. And so that's when you're like, you know, if, if a girl's backstage and, you know, we're backstage on a show, I know every single model that's going to that's gonna be walking that show. I'm not just thinking about the first girl who's going out and I'm worrying about that. And it's the same with my team. You know, I know every single person that's on the team. If I'm working on a, a, a big major production, like we just did something last season with Oswald Boateng in New York, and he had like 100 models and 80% of them were black models. And the, 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 the call out when you're building a team and you're putting assistants out is really simple. It's like you're asking those questions because you're, 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 you don't want to have the situation where someone's in that firing line and they can't perform, you know? It's kind of about, it just goes back to education for me. I think it's, it, it's not just about the hairdressers, it's, it is about the producers, it's about people. It's about, it's about the designers. It's about, you know, the, the collaborative side of things where people understand like, yeah, you've got to understand the differences and the nuances, but it's also about execution, right? Yeah. Yes. Rom oh, Navasha, did you want to say something? I saw you light up. Okay. Uh, Romero? So to add, yeah, I totally agree with Johnny and Navasha and, and it really, the consequence of this could be, you know, people of color, artists and models not being rehired because of the result of how she looks. This yeah. is a problem because it, it's just, it's giving less opportunities for artists of color and models of color um, because it doesn't go right. So it's just something, you know, as Johnny said, I, I feel like we all have the power to make change, whether it's it's artistry, production, the designers, you know, big companies, you know, we have to look at it that way. But the result is, and especially in this COVID world that we're living in right now, um, th the issue could be just not being rehired. And that that's bigger than anything else. I mean, wow. Do you, th do you, I just have to ask, do you think that your non um, person of color counterparts think about it on that level? If it I doesn't, I, I don't, I, I think they don't. If it doesn't, uh, if you're not a person of color, I feel like it won't, you won't think about it. It won't matter to you. Okay. But for I, all of us, when we, when we all walk into the room, you know, it doesn't come in your program, right? You're not a person of color, it's not gonna to happen to you. You'll be rehired. Right. Wow. Oh wow. Right. There's more <laughs> pressure. There definitely is more pressure. And and especially now. And so I think it's really critical, you know, like if you if this doesn't go right, it could start a chain of not being hired, you know, and that's a problem. So you guys are all thinking about getting your major. I'm coming to you, Kendall. I did not forget you. But you guys are thinking about getting your major looks on, getting your concepts down, and you're thinking about the model and the, her future. That's that's a lot. That's a lot, guys. And 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 you're and you're artists and you're business people. And I I'm I'm blown away right here. So I'm just gonna pass the mic to Kendall. <laughs> One of the things I feel is that when um, when I used to go into a room, I used to go into the room, like, and I, I bet you, like many of our counterparts here now, be the only African-American or one of two or three in that room. And with all honesty, at one point, I would be like, oh, well, wow, I'm here. I would feel a sense of honor that I was able to make it to this space and I'm able to work with this collective of people. Well, now it's different because now I'm there and I feel when you walk into these spaces, you feel alone. One, because you walk into this space as an artist, you walk into this space as a brown human being, all of those things are already against you in this industry. A, because again, like Navasha said, we are put into these boxes because we can do textured hair. And let me not discredit my textured women. I love to do textured hair with all of my heart. I do not discredit it in any kind of way. However, when you get these jobs, and because all of us have traveled the world and we have taken the investment to become stronger artists, which means that, you know, for me, I've been able to work in a hair salon and understand what it means to put gel on 
dry hair or wet hair and what it's going to do for it. When to pull out a water bottle and when not to pull out a water, water bottle. When to use edge control and when not to use edge control. These are the things that make, make us separate and stand out when it goes to backstage. These are some of the things that don't just come with education, they come with experience. And so when you work with your counterpart that doesn't really understand when not to use these things, and like Nabasha said, if you use, if you, if something is ruined, if one thing is ruined, the entire house and the entire show has been ruined. No one's happy. The designer is unhappy. The model can feel that she, the model is unhappy because she can feel that all of these people are now diving on her trying to do all of these things because everyone is untrained on how to just handle the simple task on hand. Here's the, here's the problem for me. The producers, the designers, and the people who hire on these higher levels, I feel like if they're uneducated on how to hire, what to look for when you are hiring these people. I also feel that there needs to be more education out here as far as textured hair. I feel that, you know, um, you have all of these classes online right now and every, even before on how to do a perfect ponytail. When you go through the how to take this class and you pay $1,100 to take this class on how to do a perfect ponytail, there is no kinky, coolly, curly hair in there on how you're going to go from a sponge to extend it to a clean finish. The only thing that they're teaching in these classes are you get a, a beautiful silhouette of a slight wavy hair and you're either going to learn how to blow out with a flat brush or a round brush to achieve the look. And this is where the lack of education comes in for us as brown human beings, because we're not being taught that. We're being taught on how to understand the tricks of these leading artists from the 80s and the 90s, and no disrespect to any of them at all, because I have I, I learned a lot of tricks. But again, we are trying to change the world. We have a team of people trying to do everything to understand how it works on all texture. Kendall, one second. On my end, it's a bit distorted. Everyone else? Because I want you to repeat that if if we didn't hear that. It was distorted. It was distorted. Can you please repeat that? Because I, I want everyone to hear what you were saying. You, It was a little delayed. So but what I was saying was is that, geez, I lost it. I was so into it. But basically you walking are. into a space and having the entire team understand how to handle texture, you know, when to use the product on texture, what products to use on certain textures, like, like Romero's hair right now. That's a very tricky, like, if you don't understand how to work with that and how to lay that, you'll pull out a hundred products trying to get it down. <laughs> and, it's a, and it's simply understanding texture. It's simply understanding what's going to revert a coily hair back to its actual texture. And I've actually been on a team where I'm working with someone that is not the same uh, color as me, and they pull out something, and, it, and it's a battle. And I don't want it to be a battle, so I have to step away. And now the hair that we just moved is now crinkly. And now that we're in this together, now uh, for me, it's the black man that fucked it up. Excuse me, that messed it up. I'm so sorry. Oh, no. I'm so it's, sorry. It's, it's, that just messed it up. Express yourself. Please, bro. Say it like it is. That's just what it, <laughs> it came out. Oh, but I'm well, that's, not, yeah, that's, we're that's how I feel. We're, we're here for it. <laughs> we're here. We're here. We're hearing. People got ears. It's all good. Don't worry. So you, you actually so that's my experience. That's well, Celia, did you want to say something? No, I was just saying it's it's uh it's great to hear and uh and, and it's it's important to speak the truth and to speak everyone's truth. Uh, for for me, it's I've seen it from all angles. I've been in the business for countless amounts of years, from being in front of the camera to behind the camera, to to doing show division now, and uh, and as speaking from a model's perspective, um, you get there, you sit in the chair, and it's Russian roulette. You just hope that whoever you're sitting in front of or behind knows what they're doing, because if they don't, you'll come out with no hair, you'll come out with broken hair. Or, or you'll come out, regardless, feeling less than. And, and I think this is an important point to make, is that the, the model sitting in the chair automatically is worried about things that they're 
non-color uh, counterparts don't even think about. You sit down, you get your hair done, you get your makeup done, and you're out. When you sit down as a person of color, you have to worry about several things. Each model, each professional black model will have two things in their, in their model's bag. One is they will always carry their own foundation, and the other one is they'll always have some products, hair products, because they are concerned that the people who are working with them are not proficient in working on their tones or on their texture of hair, which is, to me, at this stage of the game in 2020, when there is so much more diversity, which is fantastic, diversity on the runway, um, what we don't have is the inclusivity. And what people don't realize is there's a huge difference between diversity and inclusivity. And because diversity is the ability to be able to have um, more women of color, men of color, models of color on the runways, to have more people of color backstage. The inclusivity part comes when you give these people who are considered diverse, the tools to be able to do what they do to the best of their ability. So the inclusivity includes also education. The inclusivity means that there has to be, everyone backstage has to know how to work on textured hair. Everybody backstage has to have a full range of colors. Everybody has to understand the nuances of, of, of beautiful chocolate skin. And, and that's really the part that I don't get. I, I modeled in the, in the 80s, and here we are in 2020 with the same issues. So uh, at a certain point, it, it has to stop. It really does. And, and the thing is, it's, um, there are solutions, and the solutions are so simple. And as everyone has, has reverted back to, is the education. You know, um, the education is key, whether it be for makeup or whether it be for hair. It is important and it's imperative that anybody who's working backstage, especially in this diverse landscape that we have now, that everybody is proficient in terms of working with textured hair and darker skin tones. And, and to me, at this point, there, there really are no excuses. There are none. You none. know, you guys, have, you guys have really shared how how responsible you feel for the models you're working with, your responsibility towards the client that you're working with. And you've, you've also shown um, a lot of accountability for your work and for the image that you're creating as image creators. Um, and the beauty that you're creating in a situation that is not um, conducive to your work at times. And so I wanted to ask you guys, who do you think, you you kind of went in this direction and you um, talked about this, Kendall, when you said that the design, who are we holding accountable for? Accountable, the designer, the, the, um, the production manager, um, who are the, the um, who are the resources, who are the decision makers that we are uh, account, who should we ha hold accountable for creating an inclusive situation? And thank you for good. that, 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 that explanation, Celia, because that was, that was so clear. Um, I feel Kendall? Accountability is, it's, it's, it starts way up. It starts really, really high on the totem pole because, again, when you are choosing these models for these huge campaigns, right? You get the models, you figure out who you're going to be working with, and now it's time to choose the team. Well, when you choose the team, the team comes from production agencies, the really the the, the people that hold the weight and hold the power. Most times, they're choosing these teams off of the tears that they see, off of the book that has been created off of the image that has been created, but not understanding that it takes, again, it takes education to be able to do these things. And I feel that when you, so say if, if we are being hired for, to work for an African-American company and they want only African-American talent, now we're being put into a box because they only want African-American talent. They only want us because we can do this specific job. I feel that it's the agents that are irresponsible. I feel that it's the production that is responsible. I feel that it's some of the editors that is responsible. I just feel collectively as a whole, we need to understand what to look for from an artist on a new understanding. It is 2020. 
you know, and people have taken this industry by storm. You have social media where people are showing you who they are and they are just as good as someone that's been doing this for 20 years. It does not take away from the person who has been doing this for 20 years that can show, show you something. But, you know, the industry has changed. It's a whole new conversation and they're not letting people in based on what they don't have or what they don't see in their books. So for me, it starts at the top of the totem pole because that's where it is. Production, agents, all of that, it's all there. I think that we need to understand what it looks like to get a beautiful blowout when you see something like on Navasha's page and you see her creating this beautiful silhouette and all of her baby hairs and all of that. Like that takes work. You can you have to understand how to achieve that. And you know, it's just not some you no know, Joe Schmo just coming from somewhere trying to figure this figure these things out. I feel again, it's at the top, and the top needs to be educated. And this is what they're doing right now. They're listening. Hope you guys are all listening with no offense, because we're just trying to change the narrative of what's going on. And for me, I've been in New York City for the last six years, and I have been, it's been, it's, it's no easy walk, it's no walk in the park. You know, it's no walk in the park. Things have been thrown at me in all kinds of ways. And, you know, I'm still here, I'm still standing, but it's not easy. It is not an easy thing to stand with, 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 with dignity and stand with your shoulders held high, all of these things going against you when it's in the big boy's office. That's my, that's my take. I get really obsessed when you start describing um, the processes. I just have to say that. <laughs> I really do. Kendall, when you start describing. Like, yeah, I, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to pass the mic to Navasha. Passion, brother. It's in the I, heart, right? It's passion. I know. It's passion like, for what we do, right? <laughs> we love it. Um, I agree with Kendall wholeheartedly. What I will say is I think that the responsibility lies with the client. I think that I think the responsibility lies in the lap of the of the client, and I say that because the client typically, <clears throat> whether it's the designer or whether it's um, the magazine, the client typically signs off on or recommends who they want for talent. I mean, who they want for um, as as the creatives on the team. That's the bottom line. So they're the ones saying maybe not or yeah for sure yeah. or no 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 to all of that i want this person that's the client doing that and on top of that i i think what one of the things that we have not unpacked is that you have artists out there who are using let me just go ahead and be candid you have white artists out there who are using black assistants to create these incredible braided looks these incredible curly looks mm -hmm. all all of these things all these cultural appropriation situations, they get it, they get the credit for it, they put it in their body of work. That person who actually did all of these wonderful, wonderfully creative styles never hear from them or hear of them. And now this white person is getting more and more stuff added to their body of work and they're constantly being hired. They're constantly, so it starts with the client. That, that's who the problem child is, it's the client. I, totally I agree with that. I, yes, Tamu, I just have to run to the next. I know. But, but I just, I just want to say, you guys are right. I, it really starts from the top. The, you know, they should be held accountable because they're making the decisions. But also, when a model or an artist complains to the agency, the agency has to listen and not just think That's that right. they're complaining because um, they're feeling entitled. They're complaining because it's affecting their job and their future so yeah. it's really the bigger picture and i feel like the leaders need to step up but i love that navasha that you stepped up because we are held accountable also that if you're in the situation and you feel uncomfortable that you have to say something and also should be looked at as you know you're saying this because it's wrong that you should be there on the same level on this you know in the same area with the other artists not separated so you know i feel like Yes, the leaders from the top, definitely, but we're all accountable. And, and I'm so proud of you for standing up for yourself. Thank and you. I want to say thank you guys for having me today. I love this. Let's Julia, do this. I'll let you. <laughs> thank you. It was wonderful meeting you. <laughs> thank you. You too. <laughs> you too. Bless up, Romero. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Romero. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. I love you so much. Thank you so much for coming out. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Okay, so Johnny, I am going to pass the mic to you.
Um, yeah. I mean, the guys have said it, and it's kind of that situation because if we're talking about clients, right, that comes in many different guises within within the same scenario because you know if you're the the brand the brand is 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 you know pr the brand has management it has all those kind of things these people then hire a producer the producer then puts the team together the simple fact is is that sometimes the person that's in that top job in that position isn't necessarily making the decision they're paying for it but someone's going to get 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 talked to or ask the questions afterwards, and I think that it's 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 collective, but it is about pointing the finger. It is about opening that 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 dialogue, but it's also about the fact that you know, you know, even what Navash is saying, right? I you you go down to the fact that that happens and has been happening for 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 years, and it's that fact where actually. What are you doing now? If if you know you you hire somebody to be on your team because it's specific and it's intricate and they have that skill set, then maybe it's about bringing them up, bringing them on, sharing that sharing that flavor. You know, like it's like they drop that because you can do it, but you know that's part of this whole kind of culture of of see it, do it, don't share it. But it's all a bit kind of like. I don't know, right? Like, how do you go forwards? And there's an element of, of, you know, if we're sticking together and there's an element of global unity, I think it does make changes, but people do have to speak up because if you don't speak up, the reality is out there in, in, in the sphere, people don't know. Yes. This brings us to the question of, um, Navasha, did you want to say something? No, I, just, I was just agreeing. I was just okay. agreeing. This brings us to our final questions before we open it up to um, questions from um, those who have joined us. And this talks about regulation. And so I'm just going to read it because I want to make sure um, I want to make sure that I include everything that I need to include here. So uh, it's a two part question. And do you believe that the industry as a whole can implement regulations such as the two proposed in show divisions equity initiative, which states um to ensure the long-term transformation of the backstage culture into a more inclusive and equitable system we ask that the big four the cfda the camera della moda the british fashion council and the fhcm to mandate a simple idea one ensure all hairstylists prove to be proficient in textured hair or take a certified workshop to understand how to work with textured hair, and two, ensure all makeup artists arrive backstage with a full range of skin-based products to accommodate all skin tones. So uh, basically, this question is just saying, do you think this is a good um, good strategy for regulation and asking the big four as related to hair and as related to makeup? We've lost Romero now. Um, Navasha, I see you. I see you. And I'm just going to give myself more, some more light. I'm here. <laughs> I think, I think it's a start. However, it makes me so sad to know that all an artist has to do is take a crash course in our hair. And we have to take a minimum of 16 weeks all the way up to 45 weeks of education, get take tests, get more than certified, but get licensed to learn their hair. That baffles me. I don't understand why our texture is not a part of the global education system for cosmetologists, why our skin is not a part of the global education system for skin. Why does ours have to be some specialty? Ours should always be a part of the equal conversation, of the equal education, of the, of the equal licensing. What is this? I, I don't understand it. So they basically, basically can go on YouTube or take some virtual course and be done in two days and they have a certification to learn how to do our hair backstage and make more money 
than we make and we're skilled in it. There's no logic to that to me. It will never be. I think what needs to happen is our hair needs to be a part of the curriculum. Bottom line. I 100% agree. I 100% agree with you. Um, the, the root of the problem is that uh, uh, texture hair is not being taught in, in the licensing curriculum. And, and that in itself is a whole other ball of wax. That's something that, that we've also looked into. And that will take uh, a lot of time to be able to make happen. Um, because that's also, we're talking about government, we're talking about regulations, and by and large, and, and there are, are already movements to make this happen, um, there is resistance, uh, as there is with just about everything. Yeah. But the, the, um, the initiative that we have is a, how can I put it, it's a short term, it's a short term way of getting around a long term problem in terms of if at least they, at least um, uh, stylists who have, who have no idea in terms of how to work with textured hair have some idea. A crash course will never be enough, will never right. be enough. It's, it's a multi-layered program that one would have to do. But I would prefer that somebody knows something as opposed yeah. to somebody yeah. knowing nothing. And, and so and that's, I that's where it starts. Like, I respectfully feel like that is a wonderful start. That is, that is a wonderful start, so yes. But I do think that artists like yourself have to point out the root problem, as you have just done. And I know that you could never ask any of these organizations to put pressure on the beauty industry, but if we speak about it, the more we speak about it, the more the message gets uh, circulated, and hopefully at schools, their curriculums can be changed. Yeah. Um, Kendall. Yeah, you know, I'm with. I gotta go. So I don't need that guy, but I gotta go with Navasha. I think it needs to be a global understanding of what this hair has to offer, because textured hair is so beautiful. Like you can build so many things from it, and I feel that learning from textured hair is gonna take you further than learning from a softer texture from our uh, Middle Eastern or Anglo-Saxon hair texture, from a white person's hair texture that we learn in school, is what I'm saying. You know, you, I just feel that it needs to be deep-rooted. I feel that with Show Division, it's, it's starting and implementing is a great start because we're gonna be showing you how to work with these really, really kinky textured hairs. What it looks like to apply a weft. What it look like to apply a weft backstage? Are you applying the weft from, you know, like, all the way through are you sewing like i think learning to understand from a crash course is nothing close to something that can be rooted globally but i do think it's a great start but again i'm with nabashi they need to go we like we had to do our six hours and learn these textures and learn how to cut on it and cut this all of these things i feel like it needs to be a part of you get a woman that goes backstage and she goes and she finds you backstage. So say for instance, you get a, a, a African-American woman, she has three inches of Afro hair. She'll find you with her pick and ask you, can you help shape her hair? Because she knows that everyone else doesn't know what to do. And it goes back to the core of education because we had to do our 1600 hours. And yeah. I feel that it needs to be a collective conversation for the entire, everything needs to be taught. So Celia, you have a big job. You got a big job out here, baby. <laughs> Johnny, what uh, say you? This is what this conversation. Oh, Kendall. Okay. I'm sorry, Kendall. Go ahead. Oh, were you finished? I'm sorry. It finished. got distorted again. I know. Sorry, my wife. I'm trying to listen. <laughs> okay. So, Johnny, what say you? Um. The, the guys are totally right. It's 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 down to education, and I think that you know when we talk about that, that is down to what you 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 know where you start your training, how you get your training, and essentially, you know if you're going to be in a scenario where we're talking about it as black and white, 
and, and, and learning, when we go back to the functionality of hair, we're talking about understanding textures, right? We're talking about the differences and the nuances. And I think that that comes without saying that, you know, worked with, worked for, worked around, collaborated with hairdressers from a multitude of backgrounds all over the world. And the reality is that the fact is, is that if you're not doing it, if it's not in your, your, your remit, it's not walking in your salon, it's not in your place, then you don't do it, you know? That, and that's, that's, that's a fear of the unknown, right? There's a level of, of, of ignorance that's put in that. And then, you know, at some time, our job is here to kind of actually make these girls feel great, look great, and actually feel like they, that they're the best version of themselves that's going to go out on that runway. Yeah. You know, you're going backwards and, 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 and it is important because it isn't just a, a, a you know, two day course that, you know, someone's going to bash out on, on, on Instagram or, you know, you're going to arrive somewhere. The difference in what I believe Celia's talking about and what I think is, is brilliant about that is that, you know, right here, right now, the shows are on, right? It's a different dynamic. It's a totally different movement right now. You know, we're all giving hope and giving and, and give, 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 you know, giving thanks every day that things are going to evolve, things are going to change. And I think that it's it, it it does. It totally goes back down to you know the you know in the US, you know, it's about the beauty school. You know, you go to like Japan or Asia, it's about beauty schools. You know, in the UK, it's about college, but it's also about you know the apprenticeship. You know, you work through the salon. You work through those environments. So everybody's, you know, it, it goes back. It's a pushback. You know, if I teach a class and I teach a group of like young people, that they're coming on the course because at the end of the day, they feel like we do something that they want to learn. But the whole thing here is, is the essence, we're still going back to the basics. You know, the basics are, what are, are your foundations. And they're the, they're the foundations that actually should go across the board. You know, black hair, Afro hair, you know, white hair, Asian hair, you know it, right? It's, 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 it's always growing, you know, we're always learning, it's continual. And the point is, is that, that actually, if you've learned something and that's your craft and it's your skill, then you take pride in what you're doing. Yes, I mean, I think that you guys have all really um, contributed um, to the idea of what is truly inclusive within your industry. And I mean, you guys have essentially talked about just from the education part of it and just thinking about how you're making everyone feel you, yourselves as artists and the models as the talent that's going down the runway or the talent that is um, going in, on the pages. And I think I think the interesting thing is that Essentially, we have, a, we have a plan for regulation, but I feel like in whatever education that we're proposing, these, these um, comments and this feedback should be included as well. Like this is, you know, inclusion, you know, if you are truly gonna have the best beauty coming out for your runway or for your shoots, this is how, if the person is beautiful on the inside and the person is as beautiful on the outside, then that, that is, I think, what your work is about. So I'm I am so humbled to have been able to really hear this um, from this point. I mean, I always talk about it from the fashion perspective, but thank you very much. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna ask Sasha about the questions because I know we have questions from the audience right now. Um, Sasha, are we we're doing the questions now? Yeah, so we got a lot of great questions, but to be honest, they came really early on and you have all touched on um, responding to these questions. And I'll definitely make sure there's some really great comments and words of encouragement and support, and I'll make sure to share all those directly with um, our incredible industry experts so they see those comments directly. Um, so I don't have to read every single one out, but, you know, I, I do have a question myself from being at the CFDA, um, and Celia, feel free to answer it or anyone, 
you know, what are some next steps designers? Like that's our community um, at the CFDA can take to make sure that they hold themselves accountable, make sure that they do the research and they educate themselves. And then to that point, make sure that their teams are educated. Cause like as Navasha said, you know, they, they're at the top of the food chain. So they're, you know, calling the shots and making the decision. So whether it's through UCLA, through show division, like what education or resources are out there for them to continue this conversation themselves? I think uh, to answer the question, I, there are lots of, of educational resources. Um, if we're talking specifically about shows, what's happening now um, and what we can do right now um, in terms of what the designers can do is as leaders start to ask questions in terms of what's actually going on backstage, what happens and also not to, uh, not to actually play into their defense, but they're hiring a team of people. They're hiring a team of people to get a job done and they just want to see the final result. What from A to Z, what happens in between there? Nine times out of 10, a busy designer is not, aside from the fact that they're part of the casting, but the logistics of who's on the team, who knows how to do what kind of hair and all of that, most designers have no idea. And, um, and in terms of what the CFDA can do, in terms of what designers can do, I think it's just to be more uh, conscious of what your producers are doing. Uh, I think it's also uh, when you get to the point of where you've, you've put together the casting, and that's something that a designer would also be fully a part of, um, to make sure that if there are models of color, which I hope there are, um, that, that you mandate that the people who are on your team must be proficient, must be capable to be able to do this type of hair. And, and ask those questions because generally one would assume you hire a team, they know how to do everything. When in reality, it's not necessarily that way. And, uh, and those teams will, will outsource to someone like ourselves and, oh, can you, can you send us X amount of stylists who can braid or X amount of stylists who can do textured hair or X amount of stylists who can do everything? Um, I, I think that the, the actual designers just need to ask more questions. I think it is important for them to also say, make sure that this is not an issue on my show. I don't want to hear um, uh, the day afterwards a model come out, speak out, and say, hey, I was on show X, and what happened backstage was the person didn't know how to do my hair, or they didn't have my makeup, or, or, or. These are things I think for designers that should be very, very important. I think that, that they should just make sure that uh, they mandate that, that if they don't want anything like that coming out of their show to take the precautions in terms of making sure that there are qualified people on their show beforehand. Take the responsibility, right, Celia? Take the responsibility. Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. That's exactly, because no, no designer wants to hear the day afterwards, uh, you know, uh, a model of colors come out and say, oh, I was on your show and, and the person didn't know what they were doing. No, no designer wants to hear that. So what can they do to make sure that doesn't happen is accountability, making sure that the production team is accountable for what happens, who is on the show, who is on the team, and make sure that these things will not happen on their show. Navasha? I would also like to add to that. I think those same production teams and designers need to make sure that those teams are diverse. Because it's, it's just not enough to say, oh, this group, this team can braid hair. This team understands coily, coily or kinky hair. No, diversify these teams. It's not enough of us back there. And that's, that's what's unfair. Agreed. Yes. Oh, sorry. I agree as well. I feel like diversifying the team from the top, and that's my been my main point this entire conversation. Because again, you know, right now it's a, I mean, you know, it's a it's a it's a thing. Black Lives Matter. So designers are adhering to that, and you're seeing a lot of braids on the runway. So you're seeing a lot of like textured hair, but that's that's not enough because now they're just looking for to hire people that can do braids. You hire six six assistants out of 40 that can do braids and then we're just six people in a room of 40 people you have the entire team of um the hire 
and it's just one African-American person on the team that really doesn't have a strong voice that can say, well, this is what I see from my experience on every Saturday morning and understanding what this looks like. You know, you, it needs to be, again, an inclusive conversation because at the end of the day, if it's not inclusive, it's going to be the same. So what are we really standing up for? What actions are we really taking? How are we really going to implement these plans to make it stronger and better for everyone collectively all over the world, globally? Because at the end of the day, this problem is still at an all-time rise. We're still stage, and there's still going to be um, three black hairstyles and 40 other, three other hairstyles. And then the editors, this is the thing. The editors, they feel so sad for us. They come, and if they find a black hairstyle they're doing 100 braids, they're like, now it's like all of this attention on this one, these three black people that are doing these braids, when it should be up around, around, like all the way around the board. If I'm being more, if I'm being clear of what I'm trying to say, I just think that actions need to be a bit more implemented stronger. Again, like Navasha said, that it needs to be more inclusive, inclusivity from the top. It needs to start from the top because that's where the decisions are made from the client, from the designer, and from the other, from the client as a whole. And they don't see us for what, what it is, what we have to offer. Just from systematic things that were put into place before before these things. Time to change these colonial passes. It's old. It's really old. And for somebody, again, that I'm very honored to be on a panel with someone like Navasha and Romero and all of you guys that have been in this industry way before me and has been clawing way before me as, and has laid bricks down that I can now walk on. And now I would like to do the same for people that are coming up under me and what I have to say is that it starts at the top. We need to include more brown people, more black people, more people with experience. And when I say experience, I'm not talking about just, you know, the creme de la creme of magazine. I'm talking about experience. Navasha? Yeah, and, and that's the thing. We are more than just braids. We, black artists, we can do more than braids. We can do more than an Afro. We can do more than <clears throat> um, some super artistic look. We can round brush, we can we can do a blowout, we can do a press, we can do a cool haircut, we can we are skilled. Don't hire us just to do black hair. I, don't hire us to do hair. I think that's also really important because um, this is a message of empowerment, of also economic empowerment, because if you're saying that with all of the skills that you have, because you're being boxed in and because maybe you're not working as much or more than you are working, because I know you guys are hot and you're working, but um, this is a, a way to empower you further because it will broaden um, your portfolio of what you're, you're known for and you will do those other projects as an observer. Right. Mm -hmm. So Celia, did you want to add something? Um, uh, thank you so much for everybody um, to have this conversation. I mean, even though we're, we're speaking to, to the internet and to the, and to the entire universe, it's, it's also a matter of just hearing each other's voices and hearing what's important to everyone. And very insightful. Um, and even from my end, what 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 can we do? What can I physically do? What can we personally do? Um, it makes me think about how I can do more, what we can do to make this better for everyone and make it fairer across the board. One of my favorite quotes is, if, if diversity is like being asked to a party, inclusion is being asked to dance. And so what we're asking for is a chance to dance. I love that. Yeah. I, not low, oh, I love that. So Sasha, yeah. what, what do we do now? <laughs> yeah, well, I just want to say thank you so much for this conversation. I mean, beyond this webinar, this is going to be a resource on cfda.com that everyone can listen to and we can share and ensure that everyone is taking part in this dialogue with you all. Um, so. Tamu, Kendall, Johnny, Navasha, and Romero, who's not here, I want to say thank you so much for all your insights and to Celia for bringing this all together, for steering the ship on this conversation for us. And we can't thank you enough. And let's just say, we won't say goodbye. Let's just say, we'll see you again for the next conversation. So we'll keep it open. 
Absolutely. It would be a, a pleasure to be able to, what I'm hoping is that maybe next season we'll be able to have this conversation again and say, you know what? Things are getting better. This, this is what's happening. There are more, there's more diversity backstage. There are more people who are versed in texture. There's, it's better. So it would be great to be able to have an update and be able to say, hey, things are actually getting better. And that's, and that's what my hope is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you all. Thank you for staying Thank over time you. as well. All Thank right. You. Thanks. Thank Lovely you. to meet you Bye. and to learn from you. Thank you. Thanks, Samu. Bye, guys. <laughs>